Today's episode is sponsored by Jason Jones Bits and Spurs. Jason Jones is an old friend of mine, and in addition to being a bit and spur maker, he's a fine musician. He says that he's been making custom cowboy hardware for over 25 years, 100% for the working cowboy. Jason makes bits, spurs, buckles, jewelry, and other items all handmade at his shop in Lincoln County, New Mexico, near the town of Nogal. You can check him out online at jasonjonespurs.com. This episode is part one of a two-part podcast about the late Texas cowboy poet and singer Buck Ramsey. Buck Ramsey has been called the spiritual leader of the cowboy poetry movement. He was known for his knowledge and interpretations of traditional cowboy songs and for his book-length poem, Grass. The prologue to Grass is a poem entitled Anthem that has become one of the classics of the cowboy poetry genre. Buck was born in West Texas in the town of New Home in 1938. His full name was Kenneth Melvin Ramsey, but he was nicknamed Buckskin Tarbox by his father, and the name Buck stuck. As a young man, Buck Ramsey was a cowpuncher in the panhandle of Texas, but his cowboy career was tragically cut short when a bad horse wreck at the age of 25 left him confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Buck Ramsey's three albums of traditional cowboy songs all won Wrangler Awards from the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. And in 1995, Buck received a National Heritage Fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts. Sadly, Buck Ramsey passed away too soon in 1998. I had the good fortune to meet Buck in 1996, and at that first meeting, Buck invited me to join him on stage to recite a poem during his performance. Buck remains a tremendous influence on all of us who are a part of what he called the Cowboy Tribe. I'd like to start today's show with a poem written by Buck, and Buck had two titles for this piece. One was Bad Job, and the other was Bum Thinking Nowhere Near a Horse. If you see me sitting sorrowful, all busted and stove up, and you wonder how a puncher gets that way, I can tell you at the start off to avoid all work of ground if you rope and ride a horseback for your pay. It's all right to shoe your horses and to braid and mend your tack, all that work of ground that keeps you in the saddle. But your mind gets misdirected if you try your hand at chores beneath stomping out the Bronx and punching cattle. Now and then old Major Domo, he'd come roust me during slack and suggest I patch his roof or plow his garden or do some post hole digging or go scale some tall windmills. But I'd always tell him, please, I beg your pardon. But it so happened that one Sunday I was early in from town and was holding down the bunkhouse all alone when the boss he done convinces me that if I'd pull one chore, tacking hack hooves next day would be quicker done. He said all them shoes are in a whiskey barrel up in the barn hayloft, standing right beside that hayloft pulley door. And though it took us five to hoist them up, I figures coming down all that gravity is worth them four men more. Well, I'm nowhere near a horse, so it makes good sense to me. I go don my shaps and spurs and gets my rope. Then I ambles to the barn and up the ladder to the loft, thinking I can get this job done in a lope. I straps a big old jug knot tie around that whiskey barrel, runs the rope out through the pulley to the ground. Then I delicately balances that barrel on the edge, and I rushes out to gently let her down. I runs the rope around my tail and takes a hitch in front to control the downward progress of the barrel. And I gives the jerk that tilts the barrel out of that hayloft door. And that's the insult that begins our little quarrel. 
See, that barrel of horseshoes had to weigh a good 400 pounds, more than twice what I would weigh all wet and dressed. So when I tell you that my rope hitch hitched and slipped up under arm, then I figure you can guess most of the rest. I plumb parts with earth quite suddenly, a blasting for the sky. But I meets that barrel about halfway up the barn. Well, this wreck, it slows my progress some, but it ain't slowed for long, for I'm heading for that pulley and yard arm. When that barrel hits the bottom and my poor head hits the top and it rings that pulley like a midway gong, where those fellers swing the hammers for to show off with the girls, well, you might think that it's over. But you're wrong. See, the crashing of that old stave barrel all weighed down with them shoes caused the bottom to bust out and dump its load. So I'm plummeting from heaven now about the speed of sound, and I'm speeding on a dangerous dead-end road. But that devil barrel, it slaps me blind and sideways one more time as it flies up and I'm a-crashing down. Then, you'd think this stubborn accident would be about played out when I breaks a few more bones upon the ground. No. The rope goes slack. The hitch unhitches. I lie gazing up. Then I close my eyes and gives me up for dead. Cause the last thing that I see before I wake's all splinted up is that cussed barrel a coming for my head. <laughs> Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working Cowboy West and beyond. My guest today is Betty Ramsey. Betty Ramsey is a retired school teacher from Amarillo, Texas, and she is the widow of cowboy poet and singer Buck Ramsey. Betty Ramsey was married to Buck for 35 years, and she once said this about their relationship. In high school, I had a terrible crush on Buck the first time I laid eyes on him. I loved those big, beautiful blue eyes and that sweet, magnetic smile of his. I never got over it. At 15, I knew that we were going to be best friends. At 19, I knew we would be lovers someday. And at 21, I knew we would be partners until the end of our days. I was right. It all came to pass. I sat down with Betty in her home in Amarillo, Texas, and asked her to talk about the life and work of Buck Ramsey. Here's Betty Ramsey. Buck was born closer to your territory. He was born in New Home. Texas. I don't even know if that's still existing or not, but back in those days, the ranchers and the farmers, they kind of did farming, but they raised critters too. You know, they'd raise wheat and stuff, farm, things like that, and then they'd raise cattle with that. So it was kind of a dual thing. And um, Buck's mother grew up on a farm, and there were lots of kids, and the dad did too. And so they were a farming family to start out with. They were rural people. And uh, they were musical because they grew up in the Primitive Baptist Church. And I know you're familiar with that. And the Primitive Baptist Church uses their voices as their instruments. And so they learn all the parts with shape note singing, which I know you know. And so his family just had it in their bones, you know, that they grew up learning how to do the read the notes with shape notes and how to how to sing all the parts. And when they would have gatherings, that it'd be sing songs and and then they had those fifth Sunday meetings with the church and 
you know, and they had singing schools. So they really encouraged a lot of singing, but not instrumentation with it. So he had four sisters, and Buck always bragged about his sisters, and rightfully so, because they sang like angels uh, together. You know, they, they each sang different parts most of the time, although they could sing any part and fill in. And they had a trio at first, and then when Sylvia got a little older, they had a quartet. And they were the ones that did all the entertaining for, you know, churches and clubs and funerals and whatever, you know, that people ask them to go and sing. And when I did a a, a little biography on Buck after he died or an autobiography, whatever, there, there were a lot of things that I didn't know because I didn't meet Buck until high school, and I was 15, you know, a, a, a freshman, and he was a junior. So I called his sister Ellen and asked her some questions about his childhood. And she said, we didn't even know Buck could sing that much. He never sang, you know. I mean, he sang with everybody else, but we didn't know he had a had a solo singing voice or anything until he got in high school. Well, actually, junior high, I guess. And his choir director in junior high school recognized his voice and put him in a a quartet, which went around to, you know, back then the kids could go around to clubs, you know, like all those men's clubs and different places and perform. So Buck did that with the quartet. By the time he got to high school, he was solo singing, and he was the tuning fork for both the junior choir and the senior choir because he had perfect pitch. He was just born with perfect pitch. By the time he was a senior, he was singing with the Sandy Swingsters, and that was a... a a, ba- a high school band, a bunch of musicians that got together and played a lot of songs, and they would play at school dances, and they even played sometimes out at the Aviatrix because that's where people went to dance in Amarillo at the time. After he graduated from high school, he went to New York City and and worked and tried out for the Ted Mack Amateur Hour. And he was really actually accepted, but he left New York and didn't go and do his gig on the Ted Mac hour. He came back home. I don't exactly know why, but... That must have been quite a journey for him to go to New York in yeah, those days. Yeah, it was. He was a young guy, and and but he, Buck, was rambling, a roamer like Jack, you know, and some of the other young guys that really don't know for sure what they want to do. His favorite things in high school were journalism and and music, and he excelled in those. Well, he excelled anyway because he was so smart, but he ended up making a lot of his professors mad because he would question them. And, you know, professors don't, I mean, teachers or professors don't like their students to question their intelligence or something. And the thing about Buck is, and I haven't really told people, and I don't think Buck ever made, I'm not even sure he really knew, but I did see his test scores when he came back and quit roaming around all over because he he would hitchhike or ride the trains or whatever, you know, buses, whatever he could do to get places. And um, all the way across the United States, California. But when he got tired of doing that, he came home and he was going to enter college and they didn't know where to place him because he was a little older. 
And so they gave him all these tests, and an intelligence test was one of them. And I saw the scores. And I was young back then, and I didn't know too much what they went. Everybody knew Buck was smart because he didn't, he didn't have to say anything. He just They just knew he was because of the way he thought and acted and did. So I knew he was smart, but I didn't know what that score meant. And then later, when I got older and became a diagnostician and a counselor, I knew what test scores meant. I knew what IQ scores were. And Buck, Buck did have the IQ of a genius. And, but I don't think he ever understood how smart he was. I know his parents didn't understand. I'm not sure his, you know, they were, they were simple people. They were smart, you know, but they didn't have any academic education. I'm not even sure. I don't know that. I don't think Miss Ramsey even graduated from high school because she got married when she was 16. And I'm not sure about Mr. Ramsey. You know, they were just workers. And when Buck was younger, he grew up in middle... The only place he really loves to talk about is living in Middlewell. And that was down the road. I don't know if you know about Middlewell, but it... It was called Middlewell because it was the Middlewell where the cowboys stopped to let their cattle drink on the way, you know, up the trail. And it was called the Middlewell. And so that's how the town got its name. And it didn't have hardly any, I mean, there weren't, there were houses, you know, farmhouses and farms all around. But the town itself, it had a church, maybe had two churches, I don't know, but it had at least one church, and it had a school, and it served all that area. And it's between Amarillo and Dumas, and it was like a two-room schoolhouse. Buck could hear everything that the teachers were teaching the eighth grade because it went up to the eighth grade. And he just got it, you know. I mean, he he caught on to everything really quickly. And he loved that school, and he loved those teachers because they were musical and encouraged a lot of singing and everything. So that's where he talks about getting an education. In an essay written about himself, Buck Ramsey wrote these words about his childhood. I did most of my growing up and got the best part of my education around the cowboys and the Canadian river breaks of Texas. We lived on a relatively small outfit, but we were surrounded by the big outfits. The Bivens Coldwater Cattle Company, the Kilgores, the Upper Matadors down the road. When we went to Channing to get supplies, cowboys still tethered their horses and walked the short Main Street, and the air was filled with the sound of spurs jingling in unison with the clop of boot hills on the old boardwalk, where cowboys strolled in full regalia. When I was very young, I thought of these cowboys as gods, and wanted to walk and talk like them, be like them, and know and live by their ways. Living out in Middlewell, again, that was a farming, ranching area. You know, they had critters. And he would be around cowboys. And his heritage to ranching was his mother's brothers. Uh, He had an old uncle named Uncle Ed. Several of his mother's brothers became very cowboy, uh, you know, and... Uncle Ed rode horses all of his life, even after cars and highways and roads and everything like that, even when they started fencing off everything. He ran away when he was 15, like a lot of young boys did in those days, to become a cowboy. And he was a cowboy 
all that time, and he he could do uh, all kinds of leather stuff, leather work. He's the only person I know of personally that could make those boats in the bottles, you know, whittle the boats and put them in the bottles. And I used to have one of those, but I gave it to somebody that he gave me. And Buck just loved Uncle Ed. And Uncle Ed, when he finally quit having, you know, couldn't ride across the plains anymore, he started hitchhiking. And he hitchhiked to see the Ramses when they lived in Middlewell. And they let him off at the highway, and he said, well, I'll just walk the rest of the the way there, you know. Uh, You can just let me off here. Well, it was like 10 miles to where they lived in in Middlewell to get to their house. And Mr. Ramsey got up one morning and saw this old guy laying out on the lawn sleeping, and he had no idea who it was. He just thought it was some old, you know, some old bum that had— gotten lost or something, and it was Uncle Ed. So that was Uncle Ed. And Uncle Ed, somehow, when he was a young man, fell into uh, bear grass, and it blinded him in one eye. And so uh, he had that limited thing with his eyesight. But I, I loved Uncle Ed so much. And I remember when the Ramses moved to Amarillo, you know, after I knew Buck and we were married, uh, Uncle Ed was still alive, and and he uh, had bought himself a motorcycle, and he was riding that motorcycle. And the bad part about it was if that motorcycle ever fell over, he couldn't get it back up. And he was old by then, and it was just too heavy for him to get get back up by, by himself. And he also bought himself a telescope and got into looking at the stars and the sky and all of that. He just, you know, he was really interesting and great. Buck Ramsey's life would change forever at the age of 25 when he had a bad horse wreck that left him confined to a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Later in life, he said this, For some years back there, I rode among the princes of the earth, full of health and hell, and thinking that punching cows was the one big show in the world. A horse tougher than me ended all that, and I've since been a stove-up cowpuncher trying to figure out how to write about the cowboy life. Well, when we lived in in that little cow cam, I was excited because I was going to get to grow a garden and learn how to milk a cow. And I I was a school teacher. You know, I didn't, you know, I was, actually, I was a home economist when we got married. But Buck was, you know, he'd get up at the crack of dawn, just like they all did, and he'd just be whistling. He had that little bouncy walk and he was just he was so happy to be out there cowboy and having his own cow camp with everything and uh, it was a fall morning it was in October it was chilly and they were supposed to go out and gather cattle and uh, there was this horse named Cinnamon and the Bivens had about nine horses in the string of horses for the cowboys to ride and Buck did not like to ride cinnamon because it was spoiled and it would, it bucked every time you got on it. Somebody had mistreated that horse, and he was just a bucking horse, you know, and uh, and hard to ride. And Buck just didn't like you know having to ride him as much. So, but and so he tended not to, but. Anyway, uh, Buck saddled up another horse and was ready to ride that one. And uh, the ranch foreman came over and he said, You know, Buck, I want you to ride uh, Cinnamon today. He said, You haven't ridden Cinnamon in a long time. And Cinnamon, it was hard to, 
you know, put a saddle on him to put a bit in his mouth and all that. So he gave Buck this bit, and the bit had been soldered back together. The metal part of the bit had been soldered back together again. So Buck went ahead and saddled up Cinnamon and got on him, and Cinnamon started bucking like he always did. And they were close to a, a creek, a creek bed, which was filled with sand. And Cinnamon started bucking, bucked down into that creek bed that was filled with, you know, that was sandy, which made him lunge more, you know, bucking. And, of course, Buck was pulling up on the reins and everything, uh, hanging on to the horse, and uh, the bit broke. And Buck was up in the air holding the reins. The bit broke, so he didn't have any control. And the horse bucked and threw him against an embankment along the creek. So Buck didn't roll out like he would have if he had bucked him in the sand. He couldn't roll out, and he landed on his neck and and was paralyzed immediately. And he knew something was wrong, and he wouldn't let anybody touch him, wouldn't let anybody move him. He was still aware and knew what was going on or anything, didn't go into shock. And he made those cowboys get a blanket and, you know, make a something to carry him on and put him on that blanket. And they put him in the back end of a pickup and drove him to Amarillo, to the hospital, to St. Anthony's Hospital. Well, I was still working for, I was working in Borger, driving back and forth. I was going to quit work. But I was driving back and forth, and I drove my car over to uh, get some gas, and the guy from Southwestern Public Service drove up beside me, and he said, Betty, leave your car here. I need you to get in my car. I need to drive you to Amarillo. And so I, you know, was kind of curious about this. He said, he said, uh, they told me to come pick you up and drive you to Amarillo because Buck has had a, an accident on the horse. And I, I said, well, it's probably a, a broken uh, shoulder or arm or could be a leg or something. I said, but I hope it's not his back. I said, he's kind of had a little bit of trouble with his back. And he's... You know, the guy said, I don't, I don't really know what, how hurt he is, but he's in the hospital in, in the emergency room right now. And so we went to the hospital. And I walked in, and the woman at the desk, I walked in to the emergency room, and I said, I'm here to see Buck Ramsey. And, uh, and she said, Buck Ramsey, and I said, and she said, oh. I said, yeah, he had a horse accident. And she said, oh, you mean the one with the broken neck? And that's how I heard that he had a broken neck. And I said, broken neck? You know, and I knew that was serious. I thought, broken neck, you know. And so they directed me to where he was, where they had him. And uh, he was, you know, still aware and alert and didn't go into shock or anything. And this little English surgeon, who was a neurosurgeon at St. Anthony's at the time, in his three-piece suit, you know, and just walked around like a little rooster, you know. It was really a good neurosurgeon. But he met me, and he said, I need to talk to you before you go in to see him. He said, Buck has broken his spinal cord. And he said, and he held up his hands like this, and he said, the spinal cord is crushed between the fifth and sixth vertebrae. And he said, like this. He said, when he, 
hit the spinal cord, it did like this and crushed the spinal cord. He said, we've got to do surgery to go in and relieve some of the nerve pain because he's in a tremendous amount of nerve pain. And he said, the good thing is he's young. He's 25. And he hasn't gone into shock. And that's a good thing. But he's going to be paralyzed from his armpits down. And he said, if it had been an inch higher, he would, he would, he's, he said he's going to be a paraplegic, so he'll have use of his arms, but he, he won't ever walk again. And he said he doesn't know that, and we're not going to tell him yet. And he said, uh, he said, now, paraplegics have a life expectancy of about 10 years. You need to know that. And he said he'll have a lot of problems. He said the autonomic nervous system takes over and takes over your organs, you know, your your liver and your bladder and kidneys and all of those things, and it works automatically. But he said, and your heart, and he said, but, He will have a lot of problems, kidney problems, a lot of bladder problems, you know, a lot of internal problems because he's not going to be active and move. He'll be he'll be sitting most of the time. And he said, so you need to know that, he said, but he's right now he's alert and uh, you can go in and see him. Well, by then, you know, it was hard not to have tears. And uh, I went in and said, I don't even know what to say, you know. And uh, that's all I could say, really. And he was the one that started reassuring me that everything was going to be okay that he was going to be all right, you know. It was might take a while for him to get well, but he was going to be all right. And he really did struggle to try to walk. He, you know, they made these braces that went all the way up to his uh, hips, uh, you know, these old, with these old hard leather shoes and all that metal and he started you know trying to walk on crutches and and swinging his himself because he didn't have a torso you know if you're paralyzed from the waist down you have a torso and you can swing yourself with those crutches and you know get around but not if you don't have your chest but he did have his arms. He did have some trouble, you know, at first with some numbness in the lower part of his arms. But he did have his arms, which was good. So anyway, they didn't tell him for a long time. I don't know. I think it was maybe two or three weeks before they told him to, you know, try to let him get healed from the surgery. And But... I don't think anybody knows, and maybe I, well, I don't even know how much pain he endured his whole life. And I would not have known if I hadn't torqued my hip at the Michael Martin at Christmas dance, dancing with Amanda on that, that concrete floor, and, you know, they kept making the music go faster and faster and faster, and they'd change it from the Put Your Little Foot to the the Shottish and the Waltz and all that. And I torqued my hip, and I could could not hardly hobble off that dance floor. And I know what nerve pain is now, and I thought, oh, my goodness, if I had known this, I probably would have been a whole lot nicer to Buck. (laughs) 
you know, because, and so, yeah, he, he really suffered a lot, a lot more than anybody knows, I think. What became of that horse? Well, that horse, they kept that horse. And Andy, the interesting thing about that horse is they kept that horse on the string and would give it to riders. And, of course, he was a bucker, and he bucked. And this was after Buck died that some guy that Red Stegall met, some friend of his that he knew that was a cowboy, had started working on the Bivens, I mean, had knew a guy, actually, that started working on the Bivens Ranch after Cinnamon, you know, hurt Buck. And this friend of his was riding Cinnamon in his string, and Cinnamon started bucking. And this time, and in the creek bank, he, I'm in the creek bed, you know, Cinnamon knew to go start bucking in the creek bed so he could throw people higher and better and buck them off. This time, he bucked the guy off into the sand, and he kept bucking. And Cinnamon ran, was bucking and ran into the creek bank himself and broke his own neck. And I think, I, I know that Buck would have never wanted any horse to be hurt, but he did not like that horse, and I can well understand why. And this was about three years after, two or three years after Buck got hurt that this happened, and Buck never knew that. And I have a picture of Cinnamon hitting his neck. And, I mean, Red, Red saw Andy uh, Wilkinson and showed him that picture and told Andy that story. And he said, do you think Betty would, would want to see this and know this? And mind if I sent this story and, and picture to her? And Andy Wilkinson said, I think she would be really happy to know that story. And so... That's the story, and I managed to get through it. This is the second time I've gotten through it without crying. (laughs) So, uh, good for me. I can talk about it now. Buck Ramsey found his tribe at the Cowboy Poetry Gathering in Elko, Nevada which he first participated in in 1989. In talking about the cowboy poetry revival that flowed out of the Elko Gathering, Buck once said this, The cowboy way has been lost for generations, and we're just now rediscovering it through traditional cowboy poetry and songs. We're finding our voice again, and the traditional forms give us an opportunity for re-identifying with the cowboy calling. Buck, uh, after he, you know, got healed up and had tried crutches and all that, and they they just said, you know, you can't you can't do crutches and this it's not working. Uh, you're going to fall and hurt yourself worse. He said you're going to have to be confined to a wheelchair. So he was in a wheelchair, and we had to live with the Ramses for a couple of years, and finally we found a house and. You know this old house this, that had the wide doorways, and, and well, no, we lived in my a house that my mother and daddy owned for for till for a couple of years. Anyway, he got a job with a newspaper when Amanda was um, about to. Well, he worked at first. He worked as a bookkeeper for a a guy that owned a lumber yard and. Eddie Reeves was the one. His dad owned a lumber yard, and Mr. Reeves hired Hardbuck to be the bookkeeper. And Eddie is was a musician in high school. He was rock and roll, but he had a a Martin guitar. Well, he had a, a guitar rather, 
And when he came to see Buck, when he was in the hospital or home, maybe he was home by then, Eddie threw that guitar on the bed and said, well, you're going to have to learn to play. You can't play the piano anymore. Buck played the piano by by ear before he, uh, and the ukulele by ear. Never had any music lessons, but Eddie threw that guitar and said, you've got to learn to play the guitar now. And Buck was 25. So he didn't start playing the guitar till he was 25. And But he learned to play the guitar that Eddie gave him and started singing. And, of course, he loved the old cowboy songs, the melodies and the words and everything. And that's when he kind of started doing, plunking around doing that. But then he got a job at the newspaper and became a journalist and wrote for the newspaper uh, for quite a few years until... He got fired by the newspaper because he went to a political meeting for the blacks. He was told he couldn't he couldn't represent the paper going to this meeting for the black people. And Buck said, I'm not going to represent the paper, and it's not going to be on work time. It's on my own time, and you don't have the right to tell me what to do on my own time. Well, he got fired anyway, so... That So he started writing the things he wanted to write about, which was cowboy stories, and, and he got rejection, she, rejections from that. And then he decided that he would take a, a poetry writing class from a, a woman that taught poetry at Emerald College. Well, first, I mean, he'd... Buck was writing poetry when he was a kid. I mean, Miss Ramsey had little poems that he wrote as a child, you know, back then. And and Buck wrote, you know, journalism in in school and poetry in in school, high school. But he, he didn't take himself seriously. Well, this woman that taught this poetry class told Buck he was a poet. You know, he really was a poet. And he came home and told me, you know, he said, Betty, I have discovered that I am a poet. I am like this beautiful flower that's just been waiting to bloom. And I need to write poetry. And so he started writing Seriously. And he started writing the experiences that he had had as a working cowboy. He started writing about that. Then we had built this little house by then, and I had it furnished. And Buck kept letting his old buddies live here. And I thought, well, wait a minute. If, I'm, if we're going to have people living out there, then we just need to rent it out. So this nice woman from that was a teacher at Boys Ranch who was pregnant at the time came and looked at my apartment and wanted to rent it, and I let her rent it. Well, I did not know that she was a writer, and she was a very good writer and had been published and had been a photojournalist before she became a teacher, and she was divorced. But she was pregnant, and she didn't want to marry the father because he, she found out, you know, that he was not, would not be a good father and was a drug addict and didn't want to raise the baby. And so she had him, and she's the one that told Buck about the cowboy poetry gathering. And she said, Buck, you know, Buck read some of his poetry to her, and she said, you need to send that to the Elko. You know, they have that cowboy poetry gathering. You need to send it to them. And that's how he found out about Elko. And the connection of Elko was with my friend. That is a very good writer, and she writes children's books. And when he went to Elko, I mean, when he sent his stuff to Elko, he was immediately accepted. And that was in 1989, 
But anyway, we flew there together. And Buck, I remember us, you know, being on that bus and plane, but we had to wait, you know, for the bus to drive us to Elko in Salt Lake City. And they were sitting around, these singers were sitting around, and they were singing songs like, Buck said Kumbaya. I don't know if it was Kumbaya, but they were singing songs, you know, that Buck thought, those aren't cowboy songs, because he had already been singing, you know, cowboy songs and stuff like that, sitting around playing the guitar around the house and around places. And he thought, they need to be singing, you know, cowboy songs. You know, somebody needs to start reviving all those old, beautiful cowboy songs. Uh, why would anybody want to write a song when there's so many of those beautiful cowboy songs out there that need to be recorded? And that's where he got that idea. But he also, the first cowboy poetry gathering we went to, I don't think we got any sleep for 24 hours, at, uh, you know, just trying to get around and see everything and do everything. And Buck got so inspired that he came home and he wrote that long, epic poem. And I remember, because he would write all night long. I would wake up and he would be writing. And I'd go to sleep and he would, I'd wake up again and he would be writing. And he finished that long, epic poem after that first year of going to Elko. He, you know, that's when he came home, all inspired to really write that long poem. And he had been writing cowboy stories. You know, Buck has a bunch of short stories that he wrote. You know, he was just writing story after story. And part of some of the stories that he had already had in his mind were incorporated into that long, epic poem. And then when he went back to Elko the second year he was invited back. And, you know, Anthem was the first few lines of that epic poem, and he did that. The first time that he went, he read his poetry because they told him to come and read. And then he realized that everybody else, you know, had their poetry memorized. So by the time... The second year came around, and he uh, had written the long poem. He had memorized Anthem, and he did it on a show for Michael Martin Murphy, which I think was not the big night, but the maybe the Thursday night or whatever, you know, the, that Michael had. It might have been the big night. I don't remember. I don't think it was because I, cause I flew there. You know, I flew on Friday to get there. And uh, the guy that drove him up to Elko uh, came to pick me up at the airport, and he said, Betty, you're going to have to get in line if you want to see Buck. He said, because, uh, he said, I can't even get to talk to him. He said, he said ever, ever since he did that poem, you can't get to him anymore. <laughs> and so, you know, and then he went to Elko, I think every year until he died after that. And Buck's the one, you know, Rambling Jack. Well, that that is where, that was the time that Buck, I don't know if it was that time, because I was with Buck whenever he uh, met Rambling Jack, but Buck had done Anthem on stage, now, Ramblin' Jack used to go to Elko every year, and they didn't pay any attention to him. I mean, he'd just hang around all those cowboys and, you know, sing at, at the bars and the hotel, you know, when all the guys would gather and, you know, have all that jamming and stuff. When Buck did Anthem that time, and I did get to see him that time do Anthem again, and... Ramblin' Jack, we got to the hotel where we were staying. Buck was wheeling in. And as we were wheeling in, 
this guy came over and kneeled down beside Buck, kind of hung on to the arm of his chair, and he said, uh, Buck, I'm a rambling Jack Elliott. And he said, uh, I just want you to know that I really enjoyed your poetry. Uh, I thought it was just amazing. And Buck looked at him, and he he kind of sat up, and, and uh, he said, well, Jack, uh, he said, wait right here. He said, I, I need, I'm going to have to go up to the room for a few minutes. And so we went up to the room, and, you know, Buck had to take care of himself and in the room. But we got in the elevator. When we got in the elevator to go up to our room, Buck sat up in his wheelchair, you know, threw his shoulders back, hung on to his arms, and, you know, was sitting up real straight. And he said, damn. That was Ramblin' Jack Elliott. And I looked at him and I said, well, who is Ramblin' Jack Elliott? <laughs> you know, I didn't have a clue. That's just me. I don't always have a clue about what's going on. And he said, well, he's just the best troubadour folk singer that ever there ever was, you know. And I said, oh. And uh, he said, uh, He's just great. He said, I can't believe that's Ramblin' Jack Elliot. And so that was his meeting with Ramblin' Jack. And they just clicked, you know. They were just buddies from then on. That was the connection. But then when Buck, you know, started entertaining, uh, they asked Buck to do a Buck show on the Saturday night show. And it was going to be called Buck and friends, and he could have whoever he wanted on there. And Buck did this show and had Ramblin' Jack Elliott. And that might have been when he wrote that, that whole script of following the trail. Anyway, after that, then Ramblin' Jack started getting invited to perform. To tell you the truth, I, you know, I know that I know that Buck wrote serious things, and I know that he worried about, you know, not making people laugh. And you know, he finally did that one about the wheelbarrow. I mean, the yeah, fallen, you know, and barrel of horseshoes. The bar- yeah, barrel of horseshoes to make people laugh, but. I said, Buck, if you listen to all those songs, they're not happy songs. You know, a lot of those cowboy songs aren't really happy songs. They're songs about lost loves and cowboys dying and, you know, different things. Uh, So I said, people remember those songs. They love hearing all those songs, too. And But. Anyway, I think he just felt like the melodies and the words and everything just meant a lot, and they did say a lot. When you think about the river song and You Are My Sunshine is not a happy song. I mean, it sounds like it, but it's a sad song, and a lot of those cowboys were on the trail for you know, months, and and it was hard, and and they they did play a lot of jokes and have a lot of fun, you know, at being independent. And what what Buck loved about cowboys is that they lived with the ebbs and flows of Mother Nature, and they knew, you know, how to treat the critters and the grasses and you know they just had a natural feeling for things just like the Native Americans you know back in those days and he believed in all of that and and he you know like he said uh, you know we don't care about the cowboys didn't care about what color you were or what 
who you were, what you, as long as you were at the right place at the right time. All right, folks, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Betty Ramsey for taking the time to visit with me. We'll continue to look at the life and work of Buck Ramsey on the next episode, where I'll be visiting with cowboy, poet, and friend of Buck's, Joel Nelson. I'd like to thank Jason Jones Bits and Spurs for sponsoring today's episode. You can find out more about Jason Jones at jasonjonesspurs.com. I'd like to thank Hal Cannon for playing the Cowboy Crossroads theme music. You can find out more about Hal at halcannon.com. I'd like to thank my Trail Boss patrons, Bob Kelly and Chris Ryden, for their support of this episode. If you're enjoying Cowboy Crossroads and would like to help me keep it going, you can become a patron by going to patreon.com slash cowboycrossroads. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Cowboy Crossroads. You can also make a donation on my website at andyhedges.com. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads. <laughs>